My name is Jessica Meyer and I'm from First Business Bank. Before we get started this afternoon, I'd like to once again thank our sponsor, WMEP, for hosting our program this afternoon. Now at this time, I'd like to introduce Enno Ziemsen and Randy Bertram. Enno, joined, Enno is the Associate Dean for the UW-Madison MBA programs, and he joined the Wisconsin School of Business in 2015 after spending eight years on the faculty at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota, three years on the faculty at the College of Business, University of Illinois at the Urbana-Champaign. His expertise is in the fields of forecasting, sales, operations planning, operations strategy, product development, and product management. Randy Bertram's 40 years of experience spans a broad base of industry and processes, including prog progressive tooling, stamping, forming, deep draw, assembly in high volume, synchronous flow, and lower volume job shops. Randy led the lean transformation of a major small appliance manufacturer, gaining national recognition for the company. He later adapted lean in make to order applications. He is also the director of WMEP's Profitable Sustainability Initiative team and the Transformational Productivity Initiative. Please give a warm welcome to Enno and Randy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica, and uh, thanks to everybody here in the audience. Um, it is my great pleasure to be here. Uh, I drove in from Madison this morning. What a great day to drive up to Green Bay. So, Thanks for being in this room. Even though we don't see the sunshine, we can all imagine it. And um, this is going to be, I think, a, an exciting session about productivity. So um, first of all, about myself, um, as Jessica mentioned, I'm a faculty member at the Wisconsin School of Business. Uh, they also recently promoted me to become associate dean. You know, We all get promoted to the point of incompetence, so I'm definitely there. Um, but I'm very happy to be here and, and leave all that dean stuff behind and talk a little bit about uh, essentially an initiative that Randy invited me to join, oh, that was three years ago. Uh, I had just moved to Madison from Minnesota, um, and one of my board members uh, was a, was a um, former consultant for WMEP, said I should talk to Randy, and then there was this exciting initiative called the Transformational Productivity Initiative that uh, WMEP um, was essentially working on. And so what I want to present to you for the next uh, 25 minutes or so is a little bit of the academic background behind that initiative, and then I'm going to hand things over to Randy, who's going to talk about the actual initiative and what WMEP does and how you can get involved if you want to. So um, let me talk about first the importance of productivity. And uh, this is a, a slide I, I show in the beginning to all of our MBA students when I talk about operation strategy. Um, I say, you know, it's rare that economists agree on anything, right? I mean, they, they usually don't. But there's one thing they agree on, which is that productivity is good, right? And that productivity is, is hugely important. Um, and you can certainly take a historical per per perspective and trace the, you know, in some sense, the general welfare of human societies by how more productive they became, right? How they could essentially do more with um, the same resources. And so from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, economists pretty much agree that you know, higher productivity means more growth, right? more wealth in a country, uh, higher tax incomes, uh, better employment, um, increase in wages, et cetera. From a microeconomic perspective, it means more profitable companies, companies that are growing, and companies that have a higher likelihood of survival. So in, in general, there's no doubt that productivity is hugely important. Um, but it's also been sort of a long-running trend, this measure sort of, these are productivity measures at the economy scale, so at a very aggregate macro scale for different developed economies over here. I guess you can make out almost everything except for Italy and Germany over here. But, uh, you know, you don't need to differentiate this by country. Over, all across most developed countries, you can see a decline in productivity growth, right? Sort of a, a leveling off. And it's, it's, that doesn't mean that we've become less productive. It just means we're not really becoming much more productive, right? And, and so for almost a decade or so, economists have been pointing at this as, as sort of a major problem. And it has certainly... Um, created a renewed interest among economists in uh, understanding productivity. 
So, so what is productivity? Um, you know, in a nutshell, productivity is kind of seen as uh, a residual, meaning um, economists have always treated as, as, as something that they can't explain, right? So usually economists think of any production system, whether it's a, you know, a, a factory or a firm or a market, as kind of a black box, right? You put certain inputs in, which is sort of uh, capital and uh, you know, human resources and uh, uh, land, right? And on the other hand, you have an output, but sort of the, the way that economists have always treated productivity is sort of a, it, that, that's the residual, that's the thing we can't explain. There's a relationship between inputs and outputs, um, and some of that is just the production function, but every now and then we're going to see some production systems, uh, some firms, some, some plants that are just much more productive than others. And uh, almost for, for you know, the last century or so, uh, economists have really treated that as a little bit of yeah, that's a residual. That's kind of like uh, Paul Krugman, I think, once called this sort of mana from heaven. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, you, you're going to have some, some, simply some production systems that are more productive than others. So economists weren't, for a long time, weren't hugely interested in explaining that. And um, just to give you a sense for how productivity is generally measured, all of you here probably measure labor productivity, right? Who here measures labor productivity regularly? Right, that's a very common metric, and it's basically revenue divided by labor, uh, in a sense, right? Labor cost or labor hours, however you, you measure it. But you somehow measure labor input, and, and you take the ratio between revenues and labor input. So total factor productivity is really what um, economists mostly care about. And the reason why they don't just care about labor productivity, but also put in capital and materials here as well, is because these things are... Um, you know, somewhat replaceable, right? I mean, you can, you can, um, you can outsource things, and you're going to have less labor and higher materials cost at maybe equal revenue. Your labor productivity is going to go up, but you don't know whether you're actually becoming more productive overall, right? Or you can become more capital intensive, right? Uh, replace a certain amount of workers with machines, and uh, then you're going to replace labor with capital. Again, your labor productivity is going to go up, but you don't know whether you really have become more productive, right? So the concept about total factor productivity is one of thinking about really these three different inputs and trying to understand, um, you know, really overall, are you, are you getting more revenue given the overall inputs into your production system, right? And so... You can think about total factor productivity really as an extended measure of labor productivity. Right? Labor productivity is easy to measure. Uh, total factor productivity gets a little bit more difficult to measure because you need to have some understanding of you know, how much money do you spend on getting the capital that you need and how much money do you spend on materials. But if you can figure these things out, um, then instead of labor productivity, you can measure total factor productivity. And that's usually how economists essentially treat this, right? So when I talk about productivity, um, I mean, I wanted you to A, understand that, that really economists have treated this in a fairly anonymous way, right? It's sort of a, a, a more or less a residual, and that they've treated it, but also in a holistic way, that they usually don't just look at labor productivity, but at total factor productivity over here. And uh, so I think in the last 20 years or so that the, because of this decline in productivity growth, um, people have become more interested again in understanding, you know, what drives this, right? And one realization over here, this is a very important one, this is from a, a, a study by Chad Syverson, who's a faculty at the University of Chicago, and, and within a four-digit SIC industry code, so if you take, basically compare plants that are in very similar uh, industries, right? Four digit is, is relatively detailed already. A plant that's at the 90th percentile of the productivity distribution makes almost twice as much output with the same measured inputs as the 10th percentile plant, right? And, and I think that sort of um, underscores sort of this uh, residual perspective, right? That, that it really um, of course, we all understand that plants in different industries should have differences in their productivity, right? Whether you manufacture machine parts or 
uh, paper pulp or whatever it is, right? Those are different industries and they should have different productivities. But even if you look at the same industries, you have a huge range with respect to how productive um, some, firm, some, some plants are compared to other plants. Even further, um, you could take the perspective of like, maybe this is just sort of year-to-year -year fluctuations, right? Sometimes plants have a windfall of profits and then they will appear as being more productive. Uh, so maybe this is just random. But no, this is, this is what is called autocorrelated, right? So if you measure this over time, uh, productivity in one year is highly predictive of productivity in the next year, right? So these, these measures tend to have a high autocorrelation uh, of the order of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. So this is relatively persistent, right? So if a plant is pretty productive, that doesn't mean it's, it's productive, you know, forever, but at least on a year-to-year -year basis, it will stay productive, right? So that's what we know about variations in productivity. So over the last um, decade or so, there have been a couple of economists who wanted to finally kind of open this black box a little bit more. I think you, all of you have an understanding, you know, since you're managing plants and processes that yes, sometimes you can, you can, you can actually influence productivity, right? This is not mana from heaven. This is not some residual, but it's actually under your control to a certain degree, right? <laughs> Nothing is ever completely under your control, but the things that you do, the way that you run your processes and the way that you motivate your employees and the way that you, uh, you know, structure your, your, your plants has a huge impact on how productive these sites are, right? So uh, management plays a huge role in determining productivity. Economists have always said, well, if that's the case and there are certain best practices, why doesn't everybody run things the same way? Uh, and that's an, an interesting argument, but reality is, is that they don't, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why, right? Path dependence, uh, your, your plant has to kind of live with the, I don't know, 50, sometimes 100 years of history that go into its current state. Right? And so you, even if you see a best practice out there that, that, that you think would really, really work, uh, whether you can implement in your own organization or not really depends on the climate of the organization. Right? So there is some degree of stickiness with respect to best practices. Right? And in some sense, um, what Randy is going to talk about later on, the Transformational Productivity Initiative is designed to really you know, bring that out and, 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 and help you um, adopt uh, better or best practices in industry. But I, I want to show you some data on this because people have started digging um, into management practices and at least on a, on a you know, sort of very grand scale trying to describe this phenomenon. So there have been basically two data collection efforts, one called the World Management Survey and the other called the Management and Organizational Practices Survey uh, that have been going on for the last 15 years roughly. This is an international survey where by now roughly 20,000 plants across the world have been surveyed according to the same methodology to essentially assess management practices in these plants. So this is um, a beautiful data set because of its international exposure, right? So if you want to see how plants in Nigeria are run and what managers are doing in Nigeria, you can basically look up this data set and, and, and sort of get a picture of that. So that's, that's interesting, right? Um, the other one is called the Management and Organizational Practices Survey, and that is run by the Census Bureau. So many of you have to fill out the you know, annual survey of manufacturers. You get a, a nice letter from the Census Bureau that says, uh, it doesn't even say please fill this out. It probably just says uh, you, you're going to get some fine if you don't fill it out, right? But um, many of you are part of the survey, and every five years they now complement this with what, which what they call the uh, the MOBS, or the Management and Organizational Practices Survey. So there have been two rounds of data collections already in 2010 and 2015. Uh, there's one scheduled again for 2020. And the, the interesting part about this one is it's, it's huge, right? Because the response rates are massive because basically everybody has to fill it out. So you get 80% response rates. You have no selection biases over there. And you have basically 37,000 sites plants across the United States surveyed on, you know, what do they do? What are the management practices, right? So this is, um, I think, a very good snapshot uh, in terms of what is happening in the US economy. To give you an, 
a sense for how this looks like. So the MOP survey um, is basically, the, the core of it is a set of 16 questions. Uh, and each of these questions is, is supposed to give you, uh, you're supposed to respond according to a very particular practice. Um, so for example, this one over here is, uh, this is one of the questions that I like maybe the most from the MOP survey. Or, no, no, this is not the one I like the most, but this is an important one. Uh, in 2005 and 2010, how many key performance indicators were monitored at, the, at this establishment? And it gives you examples, metrics on production cost, waste, quality, inventory, energy, absenteeism, and deliveries on time. And then you can kind of see, so how many of these are we basically tracking? And uh, they also, this was the 2010 version where they also asked you to retroactively um, kind of fill this out for 2005. Right, so this is one example, and there are basically 16 questions like it that, that sort of try to assess um, what different plants are doing. Uh, and here are some other examples, right? So here's one on how were people promoted, right? Non-managers and managers, was this mostly based on performance and ability or sort of on, on, on other things essentially, right? Um, how were underperforming people sort of reassigned or dismissed, right? Did this happen quickly or very slowly or basically not at all? So it asks sort of a lot of these kind of relatively detailed questions of like what's going on within the plant, right? And the kind of questions they're asking really relate to what I would say are these seven different aspects, right? So some of them are on continuous improvement. There's some kind of questions there related to, you know, if you, if you spot a, um, a problem, you know, how does the, the, the plant deal with it? Do they mostly ignore it? Do they fix it? Do they put in a process in place to make sure this doesn't happen again, et cetera, right? Then there's questions on visual management. So how well do you have uh, performance metrics essentially displayed to all of your employees on a regular basis? Uh, can, can everybody understand them? Do you measure performance, right? How, how well do you measure performance? Then uh, some questions on production planning. So can you guys basically create plans and follow through with them? Um, on, on goal setting, right? Do you set, uh, how, how well does your goal setting work? Do you set stretch goals that are motivating? Uh, strategy cascading, so to what degree can higher level management cascade goals down to the shop floor level and make them understandable to implement strategy? And performance incentives, right? To what degree do people who perform well get promoted uh, and raises, and do people who not, don't perform well, do they get sorted out and, uh, and removed from the organization? So those are the things that they measure, right? And out of these things, they create um, what is called a, a MOPS score. So the MOPS score basically just takes sort of all of these measurements in the MOPS survey and aggregates them to a measure between zero and one. Uh, and, and, and roughly speaking, if you get a one on the MOPS score, that means you have the highest implementation on all of these practices. And if you get a zero, then you have sort of no implementation on all of these practices. Right, so this is sort of how the MOPS survey in essence works. So how much does this actually explain uh, productivity, right? So obviously there should be a relationship between management practices and, um, and productivity. And so people have looked at then in, uh, particularly within the census data, right? So this is from, from the, 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 combining this with the survey of manufacturers. So how much do we now understand about, about productivity, right? And, and so if you think about productivity as having variance, Right, so you're gonna see a lot of variance. A lot of variance in productivity is probably measurement error, dealing with the fact that the Census Bureau doesn't have very accurate metrics on, on you know, materials and capital and in, in labor inputs. And of whatever is not measurement error, we can actually explain quite a bit with management practices, with essentially investments into R&D, with the skill set of the workers and with the IT infrastructure in place, right? So this sort of basically says that, yeah, management practices explain a lot about the things that we currently can explain about productivity. And to give you a sense for what management practices do for productivity, here are just a couple of quotes. 
So um, this is from using the MOPS data. Every 10% increase in the management score is associated with a 13.6% increase in labor productivity. Uh, right? So a very clear relationship here between better management and productivity. The World Management Survey, and again, this is this international data set, right? The difference in total factor productivity between the lower quartile and the upper quartile in management score of our firms is 32%, right? So again, that's not the, you know, we can't explain the full, like, one, why some plants are two times as productive as other, others, but we can explain quite a bit of that simply by looking at sort of these management practices, right? This, you, you can probably all agree that, you know, this is a very limited set of management practices. There's probably a lot more that could be measured, but, but just by measuring those, we can explain quite a bit about productivity differences. Here is the um, MOP score, basically in deciles, right? So one here would be a MOP score close to zero, and 10 here is a MOP score close to one, related to different micro outcomes at the firm level, uh, no, actually at the, at the plant level. So here's the relationship between the management score and productivity, right? We've already talked about this. Basically the same relationship then with operating profit, not surprising. Same relationship here with output growth. Those firms that have very good management practices tend to be the growing firms. Those firms that don't have good management practices tend to be the declining firms. Right? Exports. If you're exporting, you also tend to have very good management practices. R&D expenses per employee. So firms that are, have better management practices tend to also invest more into R&D. Patents per 1,000 employees. So uh, the firms that, again, have better management practices also tend to be more innovative and create more patents. Right? So this is just sort of a bit of a laundry list of you know, interesting outcomes that relate to management practices. Here's another interesting aspect, and this comes from the World Management Survey, where, again, you have these multinationals, and you can take a look at how consistent are they in terms of their management practices. So if you have a company that has 50 plants across the world, are, those, are these plants, are they very consistent in terms of their management practices? And the answer overall is no. So this is basically how much variation in between plant management practices in the management score is explained by the fact that these plants belong to the same uh, company. And so if you have very small companies that only have you know, zero to five plants, a lot of the variation is explained by, by them belonging to the same firm, which basically means they're very consistent, right? So you have relatively smaller firms, they can have relatively consistent plants. But as you grow and look at the large multinationals that have 100 to 500 sites across the world, only 40% consistency roughly in terms of the management practices, right? So um, some of these larger companies also struggle, struggle hugely with respect to um, creating consistent management practices across the world. Here's maybe another important one. So this gives you the average management score for different countries. And you can see these are all, you know, you can can see that they're overall a little bit lower in China and in India, and a little bit higher in Japan and the United States. Um, but what is really striking over here is comparing the black bars with the gray bars, which is sort of the, the multinational comparisons with the domestic firms, right? And almost in every country you can go to, but particularly in, in some of the less developed countries over here, there's a huge difference between management scores of multinationals coming in and the local firms kind of operating in these countries, right? So again, multinationals also tend to drive um, a lot of um, what you could say um, best practice in whatever country they go to. And generally, larger firms tend to be better managed, so the management score relates quite a bit to the size of the firm, right? And, and that kind of makes sense. Again, Smaller firms that are 
that don't have good management practices tend not to grow. Right? So if you put good practices into place, you do become larger. And as you can become larger, you also have, to, you have the resources often to put more things into place. So larger firms tend to be better managed. And here's another important one, maybe also for Wisconsin, by ownership type. So basically, public firms or family firms that family owned firms that have a non family CEO on average tend to have better management practices in place. Right? On average, um, those firms that are family owned and have a family or founder CEO tend to be the ones that have sort of the lowest management scores. Right? And that, again, this is an average. Obviously, there can be deviations from that. Um, but it's another important structural aspect to understand about all of this. So these are all results that basically come out of this effort from uh, either the World Management Survey or the Management and Organizational Practices Survey. So I wanted to sort of give you a, a, a high-level overview on the research background uh, with, the, with the MOPS score, where it comes from, why it is important, what it relates to. Right? Uh, again, uh, the MOPS score is kind of currently the best way we have of really um, tracking what practices exist within organizations. The advantage is that it's now built on a massive database that basically captures 70% of the economy of the United States. Uh, so there's a large data effort underlying it. We understand quite well in terms of what it drives. We understand its relationship to um, productivity. And so for us, when we develop the transformational productivity initiative that Randy is going to talk about in a second, for us, this was really the, the foundation, if you will, for the transformational productivity initiative. Right? So almost everything we do uh, is based on the MOPS. But at the same point of time, we acknowledge that the MOPS is just sort of a, a first step. Right? The Census Bureau asks a very small set of questions because they don't want to ask too many questions. It takes people a lot of time to fill out these surveys. But um, if you looked at the list of things that they measure, you were probably like, why are they not measuring this? And this is important, right? So there's a lot of other things which are important as well. And so the TPI initiative, while being based on MOPS, is, I think, much broader. So um, Randy, I think we can, can hand off over there. So I'll be around if you have any questions. And if you want me to go into more details, I'd be happy to answer any more questions. As Anno said, uh, we we've, were brought into the, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and M7, which is the uh, regional partnership in the Milwaukee area for economic development, uh, a few years back had identified that the, this concern about productivity. And the, the real issue at the time, or, or what people were concerned about at, you know, if you think back two years, and it's much different today, was, was the impact that lower productivity growth has on gross domestic product or state product. And, it, and it's as, as much at, at a plant level, it's about efficiency, but at a state and national level, it's about economic growth, it's about prosperity. Little did we know that things were gonna kind of get flipped, that we we're gonna see the kind of growth that we've seen in the last 18 months, the 24 months. And it's actually flipped around to where it's, it's really it is more of a labor gap where you know, productivity is, is hindered as much today by access to labor as it is to other factors. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the things that need to be addressed are still the same, and so what we were asked to do was to put together a program that would allow us to engage with small to medium-sized manufacturers, help them assess. I mean, Anno talked about a lot of factors that contribute to productivity. Uh, and from an academic perspective, you know, or an economic from a perspective, you, know, you can look at macro numbers. But at some point, you need to sit down and have conversations about what's actually happening at a facility or a plant. Uh, what are some of the opportunities to make improvement? Uh, and then how do we help manufacturers start to put a roadmap together that allows them to see that over the next two years, three years, four years, five years, we can begin to realize at an individual plant level 30% or more improvements in productivity. Uh, we are looking at ways of how we're going to measure that. I mean, clearly total factor productivity or multi-factor productivity is, is a method of measuring it. Uh, but 
a, a much simpler way to look at this, if, if you're thinking about it at a very high level or gross level, is what is the revenue per employee generated at a facility? You know, and, and if you if you look at that today, companies that we engage with, you know, we can engage with companies that pretty standard, you know, 100 100,000 per employee, 125 per employee, 150,000 per employee, all the way up to last week we visited with a machining company just here over here in Shano that is, you know, close to 400,000 per employee and they've done that in a period of 4 or 5 years. So the whole idea here is as we enter this new era, and, and what, what we need to realize is the worker shortage isn't going to go away. The skill shortage isn't going to go away. So what can we do to do more with less? And that's what TPI is all about. How do we do it at a plant level? How do we do it at a facility level? But more importantly, what can we do to spread the knowledge and to make that information more accessible at a statewide level that allows us to come to scale because the state benefits with the greater percentage of manufacturers that are, that are, are learning these things and applying them. So our goal is to, is to drive productivity improvements of 30% or more at a plant level. We do use the MOPS tool as, as, as an introductory with manufacturers and uh, for the companies that we've worked with so far, uh, you know, it's pretty typical to see a MOP score ranging between 0.4 and 0.6. You know, on the, on the scale, on the higher end, you, you'd like to see that move to a 0.8 or, or a 0.9. Uh, and really what that means is there's opportunity and we're able to, with, with some data from the firm, we're able to forecast or predict that if you were to apply resources to making this better, you could realize, and I'll use some numbers from a company we visited last week, you could realize uh, a half a million dollars in labor savings by increasing productivity, you know, 20% or 25% over the next three years. The question is, how do you do that? And that's what we've designed this program to help companies understand. And to get there really requires, we talked a little bit about management practices, uh, but it really, what we've identified and we worked with, uh, there were, were 25 different organizations that have, 12 different organizations, 25 individuals that over the period of six to eight months pulled it, came together and identified all the factors and sub-factors that they believed were important if a firm was going to achieve the kind of outputs that, if, if they wanted to be best in class. Let's just, you know, let's, let's, let's just phrase it at that. So leadership and strategy management practices, operational excellence, and, or enterprise excellence. I think there's, if you look at lean and other practices that look at the shop floor, one of the challenges that we see is turning that lens around not just to the plant floor and looking at how can we be more productive in the shop. Companies today need to turn that lens into the front side of the business also, is how can we be more productive in our business processes from the time we receive an order, how many times is that handled, and and all of the other transactions that go into getting an order from the customer, fulfilling it and shipping and, 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 and et cetera. Human capital management. I mean, it's huge. I mean, and who in here has open positions in their business that they can't fill? Yeah, it's huge. You know, and, and what, are, what are best practices in human capital management? What are other companies doing? How are they addressing these issues? Uh, there, there are a set of best practices that are out there that can be documented that we can have conversations with manufacturers on in terms of where are you relative to these practices? What are the things that you're doing and, and how does that compare to other? What are your gaps? So it's really looking at how, how do we identify those, those gaps and close them. Uh, technology. There are people that, I mean, it, Anybody here read, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, the, the, the book on the industrial, fourth industrial revolution, that's what it is. Anybody read that so far? Anybody? Nobody? If you read that book, you walk away thinking, we're going to be fine, right? Somebody's got this all figured out and technology is going to save the day. And there is some truth to that. And, and, and there are things that are available to us or that will be, especially in the next three to five years, that we're going to be able to do that we can't do today, or we actually can do today, but we're not prepared to do it today. And whether it's manufacturing, healthcare, across all different sectors, 
that there's this huge promise that it's gonna, we're gonna see this significant benefit from that. And so understanding what that is, what it means, thinking about how that might apply to you as, as a manufacturer or in, in a business, and starting to see how those things might layer into your planning as you go forward and, and pulling that in uh, are, are steps that need to be taken so that you kind of have a sense of, you know, I need to do these things today. And I got a graph later that will show, we need to do these things today in order to prepare ourselves for the future. And at some point, this, this whole concept of, of Industry 4.0, at some point, you know, I, I firmly believe that we'll get to where all of a sudden you have interconnected systems and you have things occurring and, you know, you, it, it's, it's a destination and you evolve to it. It's not something that you necessarily set out and say, I need to bring somebody in here and it's going to tell us how to get to Industry 4.0. It, it's a journey. And along with that, growth and innovation. Uh, you know, and, and it, a lot of times it's about choosing the kind of work that's going to help you to be successful. Right? Uh, I mentioned the, the machine shop that is, you know, highly efficient. They know very precisely they've got a cube that if that part fits in that cube, it probably fits in our business. If it's outside of that cube, we're not going to look at it. You know, so they're very zeroed in, very focused on what they do well and how they can make money. And that's and, and that has to translate into their marketing message that has to trans translate into what they're doing in terms of finding the business. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's all of these things, right? It's, you know, you can, you can go out in the shop floor and you can do things to, to improve efficiency of a machine, but it's all of these things coming together that's gonna separate those future performers from, from the rest. And so what we've done is designed a set, of, a set of tools that helps us sit down with organizations and just take a look at where are they at today compared to best practices in, in these categories, and then start to identify what are the things, what are the logical steps that they can take uh, to make a progression and, and drive improvement throughout their business. And it's really two, thi I mean, two things that we're really concentrating. A piece, and I, I, don't, I didn't put that graph in here, but there was a, a 2016 McKinsey Institute study that basically found that Three quarters of the productivity gain required to, to, to move an organization, to move the state, to move the, the country forward can be had by implementing best practice. So three quarters, almost you know, two thirds of what we need to do is basically to identify what is best practice in this area and then set out to implement th those practices in your organization. And as An Anno mentioned earlier, sometimes that's easier said than done. Uh, you know, you can, you can walk in and you can, you can see the, you know, wow, re they really got this nailed, they're really doing some great things here. But going back and, and translating that and implementing that in your business isn't always as easy as it might appear. So the first step of this is really to look at that. What are, where, where are you organizationally in all of those categories? And what are the opportunities for you to improve? And then what's the, looking at where you're at and some of the other goals that you currently have, where do these things fit in? And, and, and what resources might you need and, and how can you accelerate your progress? And of course there's that, like I mentioned earlier, is that this promise of technology. Uh, the answer is technology, and this is part of it, but then how does technology tie to all of this? When, where, and it's not a linear, this isn't a linear journey. It's gonna be, uh, if you walk into manufacturing, and I'm sure most of you are, you walk in any manufacturer today, uh, they already have some elements of cyber physical systems in play. They either have machines or they have small pockets of things that are, that are cyber physical ready. They've, they already have possibly some, some automation. Uh, the, the ultimate, maybe three years from now, five years from now, where we get to where we can start to connect these systems and, and use technology to help improve productivity further is there. But again, it's, it's where are you at today? You know, what are things that you can do with the resources that you have? And, and along all of these fronts, it might be a little bit of closing some best practice gaps, it might be 
you know, we, we, I mean, there's a high level of interest in cobots. I mean, people are looking at how do I, how do I integrate cobots into, into my operation? You know, how, what, uh, we've worked with firms to help identify new technologies, bring in new machinery, new equipment that helps to uh, dramatically improve productivity. So it's, it's meeting companies where they're at, helping them to envision a future that looks much different than today but then helping them methodically step through and, and define some of the steps that they need to take on a year-over-year -year basis. This is not a, you know, we can come in and do this and you're gonna see these kinds of gains overnight. We did create this and, and this kind of speaks to what I was talking about earlier is it, it's really a series of, you know, making the best practice improvements process and information automation and digital systems. And it's, and it's really looking at those things, building one building on the other, not one over the other, but how do these things build on one another? Where do they integrate? Where do they interact? And, and more importantly, where are you? Uh, you know, and, and that's what we use the MOP score a little bit is to help gauge where you might, not that it's the only thing that, that matters, but where you might be as an organization, where are you relative to uh, others in your industry, and, and where, could your, where could you get the greatest value, short-term value, and what are the things that you need to do to build towards that future? So what we're, we're currently, and, and still have some opportunities to engage manufacturers around the state, we're, we're looking for people to, to get involved, uh, and really all, all that's required is that your Wisconsin-based manufacturer somebody that recognizes the, that you know, we need to do this. I mean, we're, we're at a point where uh, we need to make some improvements, willing to make some investments of time, and it's more, really, it's, it's more, and one of the challenges that I'm not sure that we even rec recognize or know how to deal with, one of the challenges we see today, it's, you know, it's not just financial investment, it's investment of time, human resources. Uh, people are very strapped, and we got a labor shortage, so how are we gonna get these things done? How are we gonna do this more? more smartly, how are we going to, to move forward when you know, the, the person that normally answers the phone and takes orders is out in the shop running a machine today because we don't have enough people to get the orders out the door. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges today that we have to help uh, <clears throat> organizations move forward. And then a lot of things, a lot of the, and the newer things that when we talk to people, um, they're, they're not quite ready for, you know, like, uh, go into manufacturers that could be ready for robotics or, or cobots or, or even some using some digital technology, but they're not sure that they have the resources on staff to make that transition. So how do we make sure that we're identifying where those resources are and making them accessible to you know, the manufacturing community on an as-needed basis when, when the time is right? And Finally, just that they recognize this is a multi-factor solution, is that there isn't a silver bullet here. There's, it's gonna require, across all of the various factors, it's gonna require attention and effort that's, that's invested in to move and elevate the organization going forward. So you wanna end with me or you wanna end with Anno? So questions, I mean, it's, this, this is, it, it's, we're, we're in a, we're really, we really are in a new era. I mean, it, and it, it, when, when I, I mentioned the, the text, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, it, it, it'll either scare the hell out of you or it'll make you an optimist. I mean, I, I tend to be more optimistic and, and I think we'll be able to make the transition. I, I think we are making the transition. If you look at our lives, technology is, is, is just, in, in, invaded or embedded everything that we do. And, and I think we will make the transition, it's just a matter of what do we need to do to pave the path that allows those transitions to, for, allows us to see the value of these technologies and integrate them into what we're doing. He likes to talk about technology and technological revolution. I think much more than, you know, a lot of these differences in productivity ultimately relate to plain old management and, and really doing the right thing within your organization, having the right structures in place, um, you know, constructively thinking about continuous improvement, 
uh, performance measurement and so on and all of these things. And these, these things are difficult. They've been known for a while, um, but they're also difficult to implement. And if you don't watch them carefully, they go away very quickly too. So uh, my view is much more of like, uh, there's a lot of the basic stuff which um, I think many firms can benefit from. And, and Anno asked, I mean, I was explaining to him about the machine shop we visited last week and I was all excited about how productive they were and his first question was, did you have them take the mops? <laughs> and in my response was, no, but I can do a mental tick off of, anyway, they, we didn't actually take the mops, but I, I know all the questions in the mops and I could do a mental <laughs> tick off of, yes, they hit on every one of those things that are being asked in the mops was present in this organization. And they are important. And you know, oftentimes they're the most difficult thing to deal with, but it's, you know, if, if those things are not in place, you won't succeed with the technology and some of the other advances. So was Mott, were MOTS and um, WM, MS? WMS, were they created for productivity? Um, they were created because people believe that there was a strong link between practices and productivity. Uh, and so yes, I mean, that was sort of in the minds of people. But they were also created um, by, I would say, mostly economists that haven't really run manufacturing plants. So there's a lot of things in there which are really missing. Um, so I, I think on a very basic level, so the, 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 for example, the MOPS is very much oriented on, it has like, I don't know, eight questions on performance measurement and incentives essentially, because that's how, how economists think about things, right? Um, and it has basically one question on continuous improvement. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm an ops guy, right? So I, I know that, that this stuff would, I would have put more emphasis on this, but I didn't create the survey. Um, so it's, it, don't get me wrong, it's a limited tool, but that being said, um, given that you know, there's such a huge data set now available with it, I think it's a tool that we can do a lot with. And, and we're not using it as an exact science. I mean, we're using it as a, you know, kind of a you know, Kentucky windage. Let's, let's just, let's get a score here and let's see what the potential is. And normally when we get the score of a, a facility and we put it in front of, of the executive team, they kind of shake their heads and they, well, yeah, I don't know if we, if we could get 40%, but I might agree to 25 or 30. So, but it, it's, it's a tool that allows us to get a number out there that we can at least start talking about and then back down and, and set some targets as far as improvements. One last question. Um, when you look at the, the productivity model, it has labor, capital, and material. Which one of those actually is the greatest driver? Of well, um, that depends a lot on, so the, the way this, this works in, in productivity measurement, i go back a whole bunch of slides over here, um, is you can see that you have these alpha, beta, and gamma kind of factor weights on it, right? So that tells you a little bit. And these factor weights are, are literally, they're supposed to add up to one. Um, they can be a little bit above one if you have strong economies of scale within the industry, but they're supposed to, to kind of line up to one. And if you want to put numbers on them, um, they're really cost shares. So how much of the total cost in that industry is driven by labor, capital, and materials? Uh, if you, we actually have a list um, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics where you can basically look up these numbers by, I think, four-digit SIC code. So, um, you know, I could tell you for your industry, like, how, how big the weights essentially are. And, we, and, and just before, but we do see evidence, and it's, it's still early. But, you know, Anno was talking earlier where uh, companies had started to outsource work and to, re to reduce their labor, but it, it increased labor or material cost. Uh, today, what, what, what you're seeing uh, in some of the companies, they're starting to, to substitute capital for labor. Uh, and there's, there's, given the current environment, there's a lot of interest in that. That was the reason I was asking, because I figured that as labor comes down, capital, the cost of replacing that is, is in capital. Um, 
So there should be some relationship between those two. Yeah, I mean, in general, they're, they're substitutes, right? That's why, that's the key point about measuring total factor productivity. If you just measure labor productivity, you can always improve it by substitution. The idea behind TFP, total factor productivity, is that you don't know whether your productivity really has increased, right? Because, you know, you don't know if you're really getting more output for, for the same money you spend on inputs. All right, we should. Sir? Yeah. Um, so your uh, consulting is based on the gap in best practices and, you know, striving to achieve best practices within whatever industry you're in. So we can attend, you know, conferences and trade shows and, and event marketing trips and read books. Is there a, a better resource or a different resource to know industry best practices in those different areas? Or, or what's the suggestion for understanding what your gaps are as a company? So um, the MOPS is, um, how to say, so, so we can, for example, we can tell you how do you fall if you compare yourself to all manufacturers in the United States. Right? So we can benchmark you to that. Um, I, I, I really wanted to get, so, so we can, for certain industries at least, so for, at a certain level by, by industry, we can also benchmark you to that. What we cannot do is, is benchmark you to you know, that industry in Wisconsin uh, because the Census Bureau, that becomes too narrow of a set and the Census Bureau gets nervous about you know, releasing kind of very, very small number averages because they don't want people to be identifiable, right? So, but you could, for example, um, we have these, these, we have average mob scores by industry, right? Together with standard deviations. So we could tell you, well, if you fall into this four-digit SIC code, this is where you fall in terms of your MOPS score. So we, could, we can benchmark you on that. Um, and so we can tell you, in some sense, also some of the practices, right, where which of these practices are implemented more in your industry as opposed to other industries. So those are also things we could do. Did that answer? Yeah, I guess I was, even outside of, of you know, your system, are there other you know, general recommendations for best practices other than the things I mentioned, or is that kind of the norm? We, 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 in, in terms of development of the assessment tools, we um, borrowed liberally from many tools that were out there. I mean, we didn't reinvent the wheel. I mean, we, we found that we had to be more creative on the technology side, but when you look at some of the other things uh, on human capital, uh, leadership management, operational excellence. There's a lot of tools out there that, that help you look at you know, various practices within a firm and what best practices are. They may not be f industry specific, they're more, they're more generic, but uh, you know, those are the tools that, that we generally use. If there's a need to drill down deeper into an industry, we'd have to take a look, you know, industry by industry, look at what information might be out there in addition to what we're using. Yes, ma'am. Randy, if a company wanted to get enrolled in TPI, um, what would they do and what would they expect as far as process after that? Uh, well, they, they would just reach out to, to me or Carol, but to me if, if they're here today. Uh, we certainly can talk and uh, it would just be a fairly simple conversation and we'd kind of qualify the interest and then explain the process to them in terms of the assessment, the MOP survey, getting some baseline data, going through the assessment, and then rolling out from there what, what, what implementation projects might, uh, might line up for them going forward. So at, at the very simple level, uh, we put the MOP survey online. You can get the link from Randy, and we'll already give you a benchmarking of like, okay, given your responses, this is how you fall, you know, compared to basically all, all US companies that were surveyed as part of the MOPs. And we'll also tell you, well, if you can move from, let's say you're in the 50th percentile now, if you can move to the 80th percentile, this is what you would expect in terms of productivity gains, profits, et cetera. Right, so that tool we've actually put online and you can literally, if you feel comfortable that, that you know enough about your organization, about the practices and things going on in your organization that you can fill it out, that takes 15 minutes and you get like easy feedback. But that's just a conversation starter, right? And some of the things that, that we're talking about here, you know, whether you look at it from MOPS, but it, it's simple things. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe they're not even measuring productivity. 
or maybe they're only measuring direct labor productivity. Uh, you know, so part of it is really what, what measurements might they need to put in place, you know, how do they, you know, how do they communicate, you know, how do they set targets, how do they communicate. I mean, one of the things that uh, it's not going to be one or two people in an organization that make this happen. Part of it is, and I hate to use this term because I hear it a lot, is, well, you need employee engagement. But part of it is, you know, how do you, how do you bring the workforce around this? How do you motivate, you know, your employees to help drive that forward? And, and how do you engage them in the, in the entire process? Because, uh, you know, every day people are, you know, are either have a chance to influence things in a positive way or in a negative way. And, and, and how, do you, how do you get everybody pulling in? one direction and how do you get their feedback in terms of what are the things that they need so that they can be more productive or perhaps, you know, how could they, uh, you know, do more, you know, with the time that, that they're active. Uh, I, I've been around manufacturing floors for a long time and, you know, one of the things that, that I like to do is just kind of walk through and, it, and even, you know, if, if you, everybody in this room probably does the same thing. If you're just doing a walk through the plant, um, you know, how much activity do you see and how much of the activity is really value added and how much of that is doing things that, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's not value added and not necessary, but how do, you, how, do you, how do you move and how do you get more of that, that action or that effort put towards value added and how do you redesign your systems and processes to make that happen? So it's a very methodical process to start addressing some of those things. Uh, you guys had a chart up earlier that showed the productivity growth over time, and over time it has declined to the point where it's about not growing at all. Why was the why is the trend going downwards, and what's yeah. the forecast for the future? <laughs> well, um, good question. So I don't think there's an easy answer to that, right? Um, So I, I don't. I can tell. I can't tell you the one factor on, on why this happened. Um, I mean, you know, part of it might just be. Uh, you know, some of it is sort of the development cycle of these economies, right? Uh, some of it might just um, relate to. Uh, you know, this was sort of maybe the period when where a lot of. Um, activities moved from Europe and the US to Southeast Asia, right? So maybe that's part of it, but I don't know. I mean, people have, you can pick up 10 articles and they give you 10 different reasons. I don't think there's like one single story of why this has happened. People will talk a lot about, well, you know, this is really kind of a decline overall in manufacturing uh, and then sort of an increase in services. <coughs> And, and services, you're much more limited in terms of productivity improvements. So, you know, maybe this is just a natural shift in terms of economic activities. I don't know. So, as I tell you, there are 10 different reasons for this. Um, I don't, I haven't found like the one thing that people agree on and what's caused this shift. I'm not nearly smart enough to really try to interpret all of that chart, but one, one of the things that, that for, because I, can't think about all that, but one of the things that, that, that I've uncovered that is, I think, very valuable is that we tend to think that 3% 3, 3 growth is, is normal growth, and if you look over history, uh, that's pretty much what the average growth was during different periods of time. And an interesting fact about that is when we experienced those 3% growth rates, roughly half of that growth came from new people entering the workforce, so the ability to add employees. And the other half came from innovation by bringing, introducing new technologies or, or innovation in, in the business. And one of the things that uh, the alarm right now or, or the thing that is, is most concerning is we see the, the innovation side, but we know that we don't have access to workforce. And so what impact is that going to have? And so really what needs to happen to a large extent is uh, productivity needs to make up that gap in workforce. So if, if you know, so if, if, and that's like an 80% drop in, in productivity if we, if we don't achieve that. Uh, and then what, you know, what exactly happened during all those different periods? I don't think anybody, there's a lot of economists, like, like Anno said, there are a lot of economists that, that evaluate that. Uh, nobody really kind of knows for sure. There's different trends and, 
you know, but definitely if you, if you go beyond 2015, you know, that right now for, for the United States, that's, that trend is, is, is it, that trajectory is changing, at least for the short term. Thank you. Thank you.